Welcome to another edition of The Evans Life, a remarkable adventure podcast. We are grateful to be with you. Bob Evans here with my beautiful wife, Diane. Hi, everybody. We are the parents of 18 children, and we are delighted to welcome to the podcast today two of our heroes, and you'll find out why yeah. Yeah, in just a minute. But uh, Greg and Holly Richardson are joining us, and and we're just so glad you could be here with us. Thank you both for being with us. Thank you. It's our pleasure. Let me tell you just a little bit about them before we get going here. Holly is a remarkable woman. Her husband, Greg, of course, is no less remarkable. Holly is a columnist for the Deseret News and editor of utahpolicy.com, a daily newsletter. She is an author, speaker, international humanitarian. She has degrees in nursing and communications with an emphasis in public relations. She's got a master's degree in professional communication and is finishing up her doctorate in political science at the University of Utah, where she is majoring in public administration, specifically nonprofit management and minoring in international relations. Her website is hollyrichardson.org, where you will find resources for becoming all that you can be, <laughs> dealing with stress, and she's an expert in that, yeah. and, and the details on her and Greg's remarkable adventure. Now, Greg has over 35 years of experience in the software industry, with the last 16 focused on identity and security. He is currently the identity architect for the BYU Universe of Universities, where he is responsible for authentication authorization services. His real love, though, is being a dad and now a grandpa. And together, Greg and Holly Richardson are the parents of 25 children. Wow. It's a shame you two haven't done anything with your lives. That's all I have. I know. I'm such a slacker. (laughs) I got excited. I made breakfast for two kids before eight. (laughs) You know, you're making the rest of us all look bad. You know that, right? You are awesome, you guys. You know, I, I, you know, heard about your story and I um, kind of, you know, like Bob said, from afar were heroes that you were able to open up your hearts. And, you know, I've listened to your TED Talks and things like that, and how you have multiplied your love. So we are super excited um, to talk to you about all of this today. Well, thanks again. The, the first question I think that everybody has, and even folks like us who have a large family, uh, we look at the two of you and in awe and wonder and say, how is it done? How, if you were to encapsulate that right off the bat, how do you do it? Well, you just do it. You get up every day and you see what has to be done and you take it one day at a time. I I like that. (laughs) That's true. And I also think sometimes people have an idea that we somehow had 25 kids that were all toddlers at the same time or something, but our journey uh, took over 20 years, right? So our oldest is 34 and we are raising a six-year-old. And so there's quite a spread Um, in the ages of our kids. But I think Greg is right. And I I think as you, I think as you add children, whether they're by birth or by adoption, and whether it's one or two or three, or in our case, you know, a couple of dozen, that, that every time there's a period of adjustment where for me, the big, the big marker was, can I go to the grocery store and not lose my mind? you know, and (laughs) or my children, right? (laughs) Right? And and, or or the children. And, you know, and, and I don't know why it was, but for me, somehow that was the marker of when I felt like I could handle the grocery store run without like tons of unnecessary stress, then I felt like we had adjusted. And, you know, there is a period of adjustment and um, it does take some time, but I also have a favorite quote and it's uh, Ralph Waddle Emerson. He's been quoted everywhere as saying, um, basically the, the more you do something, the better you get at it. And it's not that the nature of the thing has changed, it's that your ability has increased. And so now, as we look back when we had one or two or three kids, we're like, oh gosh, you know, we stressed over (laughs) some really silly things that now it's just like, whatever. (laughs) Yeah. There, there's no one busier than a mother with one child. 
Well, no, your right. first time, right. 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 It's so the true. The whole stroller is full. The backpack right. is full mm -hmm. and you're yeah. just running <laughs> into the convenience store. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so, well, awesome. So I guess two prong question. There are so many people that are listening about adoption and they can't seem to find one baby or one child. And you both were able to be involved with 21 adoptions. And then there were some heartbreaking experiences along the way. So, you know, this is such a phenomenal story. Maybe the best thing we do is just say, hey, start us when you met each other, you got married. How, start us, <laughs> how this journey began. Yeah, because I, I have heard you say that none of this was planned. Who would plan this is right? what you said. <laughs> you know, so, so give us the origins of how all of this got started and what has guided you along the way. Well, probably the start was when we had a daughter born who was handicapped. We had never experienced anything directly with people with handicaps before. And we had a, a daughter born when we were, uh, what, I was, what, 26? When I was 24, I think. 24. Um, we were young, we were naive, and we didn't know anything. And we had a daughter born with severe mental and physical disabilities, and we were devastated. And we didn't have hardly any support, and it was hard. Um, looking back now, we realize it was a huge blessing for us. It was a wonderful learning opportunity. And we learned that disability, disabilities, while they can be labor intensive, they're not really that scary. And, and you can deal with it. You can, you can push through difficult problems and it's not the crisis that we thought it was back then. Um, she, she was a wonderful addition to our lives. She lived to be 17. She, she died just a couple of weeks after her 17th birthday, mm -hmm. and we absolutely adored her, and she totally changed our lives. So you want to tell the next part? <laughs> well, e even to piggyback off of what Greg said, we actually met at college and got married, had plans. You know, this would have been the mid-80s, and, and we just thought we would have a quote-unquote normal family, whatever that looks like, but we expected that we'd have um, biological children who were healthy and um, we thought we would have a relatively large family. We were talking about six to eight kids and <laughs> we, we went a little bit further than that, but, <laughs> Over but I, I mean, that's the part about you, you don't plan that. Right. And so, so Elizabeth did change our lives, right? She totally changed the trajectory because what she did was open up not only our eyes, but our hearts to what was possible. And for us, what was possible is that we could love children who had, um, special needs, and or a variety of, of things that maybe made them hard to place. And so when we did our first adoptions, we adopted out of Romania in 1991, it was a long time ago. And um, I was able to adopt two little girls and one of them um, had Down syndrome and the other one ha had severe neglect issues. And she was um, about 18 months old, could not roll over, had never crawled, couldn't hold her bottle. I mean, it was really severe neglect and she still struggles with mental illness issues. Um, like many children from Romania, unfortunately, but it really helped us say, okay, our, our, what can we do? And then the part two of your question, Diane, I think was, well, how do you like, how do you get into that? Or how do you follow? Yeah, them? how do you? Yeah, how did you find them? And what did you? Yeah, what prompted you? So, so what prompted us, I, I think the very first time was we had heard these stories, um, early 1990 about um, orphanages in Romania. And I admit to being totally naive, I did not realize there were still orphanages in the world. I thought that was a bygone era thing. And lo and behold, here's all these kids in Romania in orphanages. And Throughout that year, we had had some thoughts about, you know, maybe <clears throat> maybe we could go adopt. But we I had just given birth to our third baby, and during 1990 that year, Greg changed jobs. We moved, um, changed states, came to Utah, bought our first house, and we're just like, okay, yeah, that's not possible. But Greg was watching um, a show right around Christmas time of 1990, and he said, "You've got to come see this." 
And when I came in, it was a Barbara Walters 2020 special on Romanian orphanages. And she was talking about some families who had gone and adopted and you know, it's been 30 years and it still makes me emotional because the experience was so strong that I turned to Greg and I just said, I have to go. And he said, I know. And a few weeks later I was there and it was absolutely terrifying, but it was a huge push. And then all the other adoptions, it was a lot more gentle of a nudge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, now Holly, when, when, um, when Greg said, come here, you got to see this, certainly there, there had to have been in your heart. I mean, you guys already had, what, three children? Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, and all of a sudden now Greg brings you in and has you watch it. What was going on in your heart prior to that that would make you uh, ready to hear that kind of a message and make you want to act on it? You know, I think there were several things that got us ready for that. We were foster parents when we lived in Washington State. And so um, we had had experience in, in having children in our home that had a variety of needs. In fact, our, we had one long-term foster daughter who um, had some significant issues. Um, and, and we were like, okay, you know, we can do this. And, and then we thought maybe we can't do the Romania thing because we had talked about, you know, can we figure out how to adopt from Romania? And we're like, yeah, no, we can't do that. But we actually got a home study and that's the first step to adopting, right? We got a home study so that we could adopt through the foster care system. And that never did work out, but we had a home study ready so that when this opportunity came up, I literally could get on the plane in a few weeks and go. So obviously the process of international adoptions back then was so different than it is now. A am I right in guessing that? Or yeah, it's so so a lot of the paperwork is the same, and we we had to do the same level of paperwork every time we did an international adoptions, and it's extensive. But what has really changed is the number of countries that are allowing children to be placed for international adoption, and that what it, that is um, something that just really breaks my heart because. The number of adoptions now happening internationally have just dropped dramatically. And, and personally, I think it has a lot to do with politics. I think um, political leaders in other countries have decided that they don't want to send their kids out of the country because it quote unquote looks bad. And you know what's sad, of course, is that the kids stay in orphanages. It's not that they're not having, it's not that they're having fewer kids go into the orphanages, it's that they now don't have families to take them and so they're being raised in orphanages oh, wow. mm. well so so greg said come here you decide to go to romania you know greg i gotta tell you most of the time it's us ladies right holly <laughs> that's saying sweetie are you hearing are you feeling but did you have that feeling thoughts what what came did, into did, your yeah, mind yeah did you have any you? idea it was going to result in <laughs> this some men no, have to no, be no, careful no. who they tell it to <laughs> i i didn't even think at that time when I said, you got to come see this, that that would result in an adoption. I, I, it was just extremely emotional. It was a very powerful show. And I just, you know, she needed to see it. We needed to see it together. And uh, of course, push led to shove. And before you knew it. Uh, who was we pushing in, and who was shoving? <laughs> <laughs> you showed. Yeah, I, I would say um, one of the things that was interesting for me especially looking back as we had some real consistency when we um, came to adopt the next child or children. And it was things like uh, we would get the whole family together around the dinner table and I would start counting and say, there's somebody missing. And I would count and they would not be missing. And we would do prayer together as a family. And I'd say, there's somebody missing. And I would count and nobody was missing. Um, and, and Diane, to your point, a lot of times I was the one who was saying, saying this this first not always but a lot of the times uh -huh. and then greg sometimes would have dreams and he would have dreams of you know disasters tsunamis or earthquakes or whatever and trying to rescue his family and he can't find them all and oh, he would wake oh, up and tell me and i would say greg it's a sign <laughs> <laughs> well i tell you the odds of the odds of finding them all now are a lot the, the <laughs> luck what more difficult than they would have been if you've had fewer children i've been right, oh, right that right. is <laughs> so awesome you know you guys play together so well as a team you know were there was there ever a time when one of you said honey you know not everybody's here at the table 
you didn't get everybody in that dream last night. How did you ever, I mean, I've had people ask me how, what do you do when one's ready to adopt the other mm-hmm. one's like, wait a minute, we're yeah, up to our eyeballs. We're, yeah. You know, we're, I'm, my treading water is not as effective as yours. So tell yeah. us how you work through that. Um, I'll, I'll start if that one's okay, because, <laughs> because um, a lot of people ask that. And a lot of people have, have asked me specifically how I quote unquote, got Greg to let me adopt. And the first thing I have to say is you don't accidentally adopt, right? This is a joint process. There's a lot of papers to sign. This is not something that comes by surprise. But but we had decided early on um, that this was such a major decision that we both had to know for ourselves that this was the right move. And there were times where I wanted to move forward and Greg was really uncomfortable. And eventually I rec- recognized that we should not move forward with that particular child or that circumstance. And, you know, we just waited until we were both on the same page. And sometimes it went one way and sometimes it went the other way. Right. But for me, that was our, my perspective, right. Of saying, even though I started pushing a lot earlier, um, we still had to be on the same page before we actually took action. And now yeah. Greg can tell you his side. <laughs> yeah, Greg, I, I'm dying to hear what you have to say on this. So I think Holly's right that most of the time she's the one who got the impressions first and I would follow along later on. There were times for each of us when, when one of us was ready and the other wasn't. Uh, there, there was one child that we accidentally agreed to adopt yeah, but you're not supposed to tell that story. <laughs> you give people well, up. we're here. <laughs> she, she, she's, she is such an amazing young woman. And uh, probably the, the one that, for, of all the kids, Holly's the one she confused is the most with having given birth to her. She's oh. not the same ethnicity as me. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but, yeah. but sometimes Holly has to think, oh, yeah, I adopted her. It was just a perfect uh, experience. Yeah. Um, it was it was nine days from when we found out about her to when she was in our house and she's 20 now but she came to us when she was four so it oh, was wow. um, i thought i was saying yes let's um meet her and the her people that i was talking to were like okay we're bringing her to you and i told greg uh we're getting a daughter on friday <laughs> <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> so, so besides that he still had some papers but <laughs> Well, Holly, there was something that you said just a few minutes ago in regard to uh, the international adoption, and and you heard after you went through that for those first two adoptions uh, internationally, you you mentioned that you you heard the faintest whisper, yeah, oh. and then do it again, yeah, and and when you hear when tell me about hearing that faintest whisper and being able to act on the faintest whisper. How do you do that? And how do you identify it? So I think that's a really great question. And the experience with Romania was so overwhelming. Like I just felt like my whole body was on fire. I mean, it was like head to toe. I just, I just knew I had to go. And then after that, I was looking for those types of experiences and I didn't get them. But what I did get was those things that I mentioned already, feeling like you count the kids at the dinner table and they're not all there, but they are, but they're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we, I, that's exactly how it's happened for us every single yeah. time. Every yeah, time. And, and I think it's those little nudges. And then you start to say, okay, well, now I'm starting to see a pattern. Like this is now four adoptions later. And I, you know, it's <laughs> maybe, you know, a little concerning when Holly says to Greg, hey, um, I don't think all the kids are here. And um, I, I think there was one, there's probably multiple points actually where people asked us, are you ever gonna stop, right? Mm-hmm. And, and we actually do know people who adopted uh, much older than we are, mm-hmm. but we're in our mid to late fifties and we know people who have adopted in their mid to late sixties and even into their seventies. And so, really, yeah. And so circumstances are different, right? It's never a competition, but, but we came to believe that we would know when the stopping point was, and it it did become clear that we were done. Um, And it just was a really large number, but, but I think, I think sometimes having the courage to act on, both those really strong feelings, but the mild ones also, 
um, it, it, it's not just adoption, but for me, especially when I start to feel those, I start to take action. And then um, I have had times where if it's not right, it becomes clear kind of quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I either stop or back up or, you know, pause those kinds of things. I mean, I, I would say typically I would be ready to add again about a year probably before we actually did add the next go round. And so we had, you know, this intervening period of time to prepare financially and prepare the kids and, you know, talk about how we're going to, you know, make the finances work and those kinds of things. And so, um, I think for me, it's, it's doing, it's taking it, it's taking action, right. It's taking a step in that direction and saying, okay, well, you know, maybe this is just me. Maybe it was just a funny dream. Um, but I'm going to take some action and I'm going to see, um, what happens next. Yeah. yeah. No, I, that's awesome. So is it, is it an audible voice you hear sometimes, or is it just a no. feeling that you like, you interpret this is the way to go. And then if it's not right, you're stopped. I mean, is that kind I've of never, I've never heard an audible voice. Have you? Yeah. No. So. You've said something really, really significant here, Holly. And that, and that is the idea of taking action and seeing where it takes you the uh, following that prompting taking action even though you don't have all the answers i mean if sure. <laughs> if ever there was if ever there was a definition of faith that is it where you take two steps into the dark and know that the light will follow you is that what you're talking about yeah it is absolutely and i i would say look i'm i'm it's really funny because i'm one who likes to read the end of books because i don't like the unknown oh, oh! I- you. Yes. <laughs> doesn't that drive you nuts greg doesn't it just drive- all i need to it know does, is- actually <laughs> just tell me where i'm going i can get yep. there i don't care what the process will is, you just, just enjoy the journey <laughs> will you please just yes. enjoy the I journey i can enjoy it once i know where it's going thank you absolutely <laughs> oh a soul sister <laughs> so, so so yeah i mean there's so much of it that is uh, unknown right and and I, i'll be honest we've had some really difficult parenting moments and and there you know it continues into their adulthood as you watch adult kids make decisions where you go oh i can see that's not going to work out very well yeah and and yet the one thing that i can always go back to is we knew for sure that this was the path we were supposed to go down and and that's specific to adoption but i have the same thing diane with should i pursue an education should i do more education and I didn't go back to get a bachelor's degree until I was 49. So I'm 56 now. And, um, you know, I, a lot of the kids were grown. I spent 30 years raising kids before I went to get the bachelor's, but I went back and forth with, should I do it? Should I not do it? Should I do it? Should I not do it? And then I would give myself permission in my head. Okay. I'm going to try one semester. And if it doesn't feel right, I'm not going to keep going, but it felt right. And I kept going. (laughs) Where, Where did you find time to do that? You're already raising. How many children did you have at that point? Do you remember? I don't remember at least a dozen or four. At least a do- oh, it, at, at home, right? How, where at do you home, find the time to to do that? I so, mean, so here's so here's my trick, I guess. And Greg can add in his. We all want to know because you're superwoman, <laughs> superman. I'm, I'm not, but um, flat, but flap I her don't... cape, Greg. You're gonna have but... to flap her cape for it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, some some I think is you're never gonna find time, so you have to make the time. That means you have to prioritize the time That's perfect. and, and a lot of my school, all of my master's degree, um, some of my bachelor's degree was done online. And mm-hmm. so my master's degree, it's, it was through, um, Southern Utah university. It was a really great program. I felt like it was really well done. I'm super glad I did it, but I did a lot of my homework between 9 PM and midnight mm-hmm. and and it's okay, right? I mean, I hadn't slept through the night for 35 years. So, so why, why start, start now? now? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Diane, you're so funny. Um, and the other thing that I don't do is I actually, I very rarely watch TV. Um, I don't have a ton. You got to keep yourself. He, 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 you keep there disappearing you um, <laughs> the ghost of greg I, I richardson I, I mean i just like i read things that people watch even four hours of tv a day or seven hours of tv a day and, and i don't do that and i i just can't imagine um 
how I could fit that in, right? Because I fit other things in. Um, and I think I think that's one thing is to look at your priority priorities and say, okay, what's most important for me? Clearly, it's family. And then after that, what's the next thing? Okay. And then what's the next thing? And um, I've had I can't remember who said it, which is unfortunate because I'd love to give them credit. But they said, remember, you're you're juggling a lot of balls, but you have to remember which ones are glass and which ones are rubber. And some things do fall through the cracks. Oh, that oh. is wonderful. Well, when you just said that, tell me, I mean how do you keep your relationship? I mean, you guys are still best friends in love. You can just see it. You can feel it. But I, you know, the reality of having a big family. And then on top of that, I mean, our special needs child only lived 21 days. So we didn't do a lifetime of extra yeah. care for her. Um, Sorry, but you had, bad. yeah, yeah. None of us, we both lost children. And it's yeah, not, it's the worst. But how do you keep your relationship strong? You're dealing with adoption and anybody, and I'm sure they've said too, but you did it the easy way you adopted. And I just want to strangle. Yeah, well, what? <laughs> yeah. Hey, there's no easy way, but, <laughs> <laughs> but how do you make sure that you two are still strong with each other? What's that something that you do to keep that relationship alive and happy? You start. Well, you have to want it. Oh, I love that. And that commitment is probably the number one. You have to want it. And I so think, wow, wanting just, it, but wanting it and having it are two different things. So yeah. how do you have it? You work on it. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to be really deliberate. One of the one of the stats that's super unfortunate that puts us in super high risk categories for divorce. Our parents of kids with disabilities have a very high rate of divorce. Parents who bury children have a very high rate of divorce. We've done both, um, continue to do both. And you know, then you can add other stressors and stuff. But those two things alone, right? We we became very, very deliberate in our dating, in making sure that we had time for each other every week. Back when we had a bunch of little kids that were not old enough to kind of, you know, babysit each other, um, we would hire a babysitter where we just said we're paying you for every friday night like it's a monthly set rate and we need you every week right so that we never had to worry about oh nobody's available and we don't have a babysitter and oh, stuff no. so we did things like that that's but a brilliant it, idea really i i we never thought of that <laughs> we, you know it's just you know part of it is you have to make uh you have to make time for each other you have to make time for communications it's super easy to get caught up in the poopy diapers and you know what school papers need to be signed and you know what's on the menu for the week and those kinds of things and we actually have to have time where we talk about well what are your goals and you know what are your interests and how do we pursue those and um how do we support each other those kinds of things you, you do have to be very deliberate and active um, I love that. I love how you explain the specifics of how you made it happen. And Greg saying, you have to want it. I think maybe that's a step people forget. Yeah. They get so wrapped up into everything. But then you said, you know, your goals, planning the meals and everything. Is your life different? Um, I grew up with one brother and one sister. So I didn't come into this knowing how to do it big size. I mean, I've kind of learned and not learned along the way. Did you know how to do it big or do you just do it little family times eight you know, or times no, 12? Well, that, that's actually a really interesting question. And I had a person one time ask me because <laughs> um, they were they were asking me about cooking. A lot of people want to know how many, you know, how much food we, we went through at our peak. We had 20 kids at home at our peak, ages one to 17. We had four in diapers, two in wheelchairs. I mean, it was a wild mm. time. And let me tell you, mom, she has a family picture and everybody is matching. And I love right. that too. You read the end of the book and you match. We were meant to be together. <laughs> but, but, but we had to do, um, we learned to multiply our recipes. It's things like, do you buy a box of hamburger or eight boxes of hamburger helper at the store? Or do you start to cook your own? And of course, for us, the answer was you cook your own. And so instead of doing eight pounds of hamburger for eight boxes of hamburger helper, we do one or two pounds, a bunch of pasta, veggies, and then, um, you know, just make it work that way. And so we have big pots. We've always, we, we just 
upgraded as we got bigger and cooked more. Mm -hmm. But I, I one time had a friend ask me and she said, my recipes don't fit in the pots I have. <laughs> my answer was buy another pot. <laughs> Get bigger pots. <laughs> did, did you, I mean, you had children with special needs, so they probably weren't the ones helping do the dishes or this Correct. or that. Do you have yep. chore charts? And how did yep. you organize it all because I can just tell by talking to you and your experience in life and him in computers, which is very precise. You know, you guys are organized people. How did you keep uh, this organized? Not true. <laughs> <laughs> it's only, it's only partially true. Do you want to talk about the so you, you have highly to structured or yeah, yeah. highly flexible? You, you, I think you have to choose either you're really structured, you know, and you, you, maybe you've seen the movies, uh, Cheaper by the dozen. Yeah, Bob mm. can't guys. watch them. <laughs> that, that's <laughs> like a busman's holiday to me. I'm sorry, I can't watch that movie. I'm living it. Okay, <laughs> that's I, right, that's it's right. not entertainment to me. Okay. So, so the mom is like super flexible, and we found that it's a lot easier for us to be really flexible and just kind of roll with the punches, and trying to be really controlling and and have everything go according to plan almost never works. So having the expectations that it's not ever going to go according to plan <laughs> is, is just easier. It's yeah, but, but, success, but, 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 but I have to add, I have to add that that it's flexibility and expectations a lot of times, but we definitely had job rotations. And Absolutely. we have a super funny story about an older child we adopted. Yeah. And <laughs> so he was one of our last adoptions. We got four and we had 14 at home at the time. And so it, he took us from, or that little group took us from um, 14 to 18 kids. And he was 12 when we adopted him. He'd spent seven years in the orphanage and they had had, they'd been watching uh, American MTV, right? So he thought he knew what America was like. Oh, that evening, right? okay. So, so we had learned with previous adoptions to not give them a job honeymoon, really, because then it was even harder to work them into the job rotation. Oh, okay. And so yeah. what we did was um, we actually had a child who spoke his native language. And so, you know, that made the, the communication easier. But the second week he was here, I handed him a dish rag and I said, it's your turn to do the dishes. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, that's woman's work. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> oh. right? and I said, Oh, welcome to America. Yeah. We all work in this house. And the conclusion to the funny story is he got an associate degree as a culinary artist and he uh -oh. was a chef. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all the time. So, oh, yeah, so great. yeah, I mean, we had to have rotations and everybody has their way of doing jobs and stuff. And what we settled on um, and worked for a number of years was that we had kids who would um, hold a job for a week and then they would rotate, but they had to have their job done before they sent it off to the next person. Right. It's otherwise, it's not fair because the next person. Right. right. So we went to the same chore chart school then. Yeah. You have to have it finished <laughs> before you pass it off. That's right. And and so the reality was a lot of people wouldn't do their jobs until the day that they had to pass it off to the next person. Right. That's the reality. Mm. But we taught kids to do laundry when they were young. And, and people think that it's so amazing, but the the truth is I was super irritated at having to wash clean clothes that the kids put dirty clothes on top of. Like they'd be folded, they would never put them away. And then they would just put dirty, stinky, wet clothes on the top. And I was rewashing. I'm like, okay, we're having a family meeting on how to do laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I think the four of us need to go on a vacation together. Yeah, yeah there you go. Sure. Well, <laughs> Let me ask you another question, Holly. You um, obviously have a large family. You had biological children that were the oldest, right? Have they remained the oldest? Did you? I mean, uh, the yeah. oldest three were the oldest, and then we adopted three, and then I had a fourth. Okay, so, but I mean, they always were at the yeah. head the of the child. Oldest of the uh, children. So no, the children. only oh. the oldest kept his place. Everybody okay. else was disrupted. <laughs> okay. Um, how did bringing additional children into the family affect them? Were they all on board? Were they? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I see stories, I mean, on Facebook that you post of your family. And I think this family loves and cares about each other. And did they care that they were adding? Were they happy to be adding? Was there ever any conflict? How did you approach the family? You know, all those kind of questions. I know you've been asked a million times. No, it's okay. Do you want to start? Do you want me to start? Well, I, it was always a family decision. It was never a surprise to the kids. Right. That mm. there was going to be a change and so we would talk about it 
and uh, sometimes they even participated in the process. And when when we several several times the, the four that she was talking about that we added, we actually took three of our children with us, and they oh. were part oh, of the wow. process of visiting orphanages and and deciding who are we going to add to the family. Wow. And so wow. it, it also seemed to be that the, the kids felt less threatened by other kids than they were by the parents. The adopted kids. The adopted about. kids. Yeah. Yes, they came into the family that was easier for them to relate and form relationships with each other than it was with the parents initially. Yeah, a lot less threatening. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think there were some really good relationships and there's still some really strong friendships and relationships there. Mm -hmm. There's also some kids that struggle with some of the other kids and some of their choices. But that's but, probably but any family. I think one of the good things about a big family is that you can not talk to a sibling for a while and have lots of other playmates, right? <laughs> and no one <laughs> will notice. And dad you, know? you have to wear the unity t-shirt until they all get along, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Greg said, it was a family decision. So he and I would would were the drivers and we would decide, but we would take it to the kids. And our last adoption um, of a special needs child was a little girl who was born missing most of her brain. And we knew from the outset that she was going to die. We knew that mm -hmm. um, her life expectancy was very short. And, and so we had a really frank conversation with our kids because we had already lost two daughters. No, Elizabeth had so she died 2007. Yep, we'd already lost two daughters. Sorry. Um, and so we had to talk with them about, you know, do you remember how much it hurt? It's going to be, it's going to feel like that again. Um, but are you on board? What do you think about taking this little girl into our home? And everybody was agreed. And it was a very really just a huge, I, I think, bonding experience for the family to take care of Angelia. Mm. Um, it was a, a huge source of grief when she died, but our, one of our goals was that she would feel loved every day of her life. And that little girl was held every minute she was awake for her life, her entire mm. life, three and a half years. Yeah. Well, wow. What did your family learn from that experience? And what did you personally, the two of you learn? from that experience from from losing angelia or from adopting a child that from we knew was yeah, die? yeah from stem to stern on on her life what did you guys learn well, you can start if you want to. she was really hard she had a lot of pain when she was young and if she was awake she was crying mm -hmm. and for about nine months everybody jumped in to help take care of her yeah. she she never did get on a regular sleep schedule she would sleep for two hours be awake for six sleep for four yeah. be awake for an hour sleep for 12. I mean, she <laughs> just completely random never normalized and so we had to have help and the, the kids just jumped in and they just loved her yeah. and and she loved everybody back it was uh, a really sweet experience to see the kids just really invest in taking care of her and everybody loved her uh, she was a lot of work but everybody just loved her and so it's kind of like you know it, the 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 puppy that loves everybody mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easy to love a puppy because they love everybody well it was easy to love her and she just responded with love to everybody back and so i think she was a huge blessing for all of us i, I think um to share some of the harder stuff so, so Greg and I knew what we were getting into as adults. Some of the kids have since expressed that um, uh, she died 10 years ago, but that they had not anticipated how hard it would be. And it's still hard 10 years later, right? It affects mm -hmm. them in ways that they didn't anticipate. It affected their relationship with God, to be honest, with several of them. They couldn't believe that he would let her die even though we knew that was mm -hmm. going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, it's affected their, their um, almost their approach to um, having kids themselves because they're worried, right? How much it might be worse as a parent to lose a child. And of course, there's no guarantees with any child. But, 
but it, it was totally worth it. And I, and I, I just, I recently had a conversation with a friend who was asking about um, resilience and, you know, getting through hard stuff. And, and I said, you know, I, we've buried three girls um, here in Utah. We've lost three more in Africa that were, we were, um, anyway, it's a long story, but we were not able to bring them home. And so they're, we've had this experience with the grief. And I said, the thing that I've learned is not that it gets easier. It's just that I know that there's an end to it at some point, right? And it feels really dark and overwhelming, but as an adult, I'm able to say to myself, right? Is I know that there's an end to this, but some of my kids, right? It's there are kids, it's been a struggle. And, and they're, I mean, 10 years on, they're, they're moving past it. And it's, you know, they find people that have lost siblings that they can relate to, and they know how to help. Um, other people who are going through grief and loss and just say, you know, sometimes they're, they're the ones who are willing to sit there and, and support them and, and have empathy. And of course, we don't regret it. Um, she's another one, of course, that we had really strong feelings about adopting and, and we had to make it a family decision because we knew her death would impact the other kids in the household and it did and it does. Mm -hmm. But but I think love is worth it. And, and, and that's the flip side of grief, right? Is if you don't grieve, you haven't loved deeply, or if you don't allow yourself to grieve, you can't get to the full expression of love. And for, for our family, we, we take that as the other, the same, the same coin, right? It's the same coin. And so as you love deeply, you also grieve deeply and that's normal and it's okay. Um, then anyway, back to my point with my friend, she was saying that there are people who are saying, well, Holly chose, chose that. So like, why is she grieving? Why is she having a hard time? Oh well, it <laughs> choosing into a difficult situation doesn't negate its difficulty, right? It's just saying, okay, I'm signing up for heartache and the love is worth it. And the journey is worth it. And it was. I think wow. for some of them too, I mean, all, all the kids who were available for adoption experienced disruption loss Prior to that trauma they, they had <laughs> loss uh, and most of them it was the death of parents and or siblings mm -hmm. and so i think this they remember right and and i think that having that experience although it was painful for them did help them come to terms with some of the trauma that they had before they joined our family you guys have described to us, uh, and, and we've only scratched the surface, I'm confident, because there's so many, many other stories and experiences that you, we haven't heard about and that hopefully in the future we'll be able to unfold, unfold like a flower. <laughs> but up, even up to this point, you've described a situation that for many folks who are not familiar with these waters, they would tend to get burned out and mm -hmm. run out of energy, both physically and emotionally and intellectually and in every way you can run out of energy. Yeah. How have you guys been able to navigate the uh, difficulties with energy and being able to not burn out? Oh, the resilience. Yeah, right. the resilience. That's a perfect question for me, but Greg can start if he wants. <laughs> <laughs> well, Holly is astounding. Uh, she just uh, she just keeps going and going and going and going. And she, she's the energizer bunny on steroids sometimes. <laughs> um, and, and so I think she's kind of been the core of the rock of our family. And I, I give the credit to, to her for being able to hold things together. She's, she's the center. How do you nice. do it? I, I, didn't, I didn't pay him to say that, but um, <laughs> I, actually burnout is a huge issue and it's a huge issue for parents and especially parents of kids with disabilities. And I think it does lead to the higher divorce rate, but my PhD research actually is looking at burnout, right? Because I've lived it. And, um, and the reason I found, I, I guess, the way to keep the resilience and the emotional well filled is because I let it get so depleted that I did not know how to function. And I would get out of bed. I mean, I wasn't stuck in bed, but I just, I was completely depleted. And this would have been maybe 10 years into our parenting journey. And I just was desperate. It was way before the internet. And I started doing an exploration of 
you know, what's out there. And my, um, my, my MO is to go find as many books as I can on whatever subject. And, you know, burnout is really interesting. They've only just barely started researching parental burnout and they really have, they started with, um, families of kids with disabilities, it's really job related. And so a lot of the advice doesn't apply to parents, right? Quit your job. Don't answer your phone on the weekends. Take a vacation. Take a sabbatical, right? You can't do that <laughs> when you're a parent. You just can't. But there are some things that you can do. And so so what I found, and, and people talk about self-care and they mock it sometimes as if it's, you know, not a good thing. But what I what I found is that as the mom and as great as Graves has described the rock of the family, whether I'm the rock or not, I know that kids feed off of my emotional energy. When I'm upset and sad, they're upset and sad. Um, we had an incident one time where we started sliding backwards down a mountain on some snow. Greg was driving and I was terrified and I started screaming and the kids started screaming. And Greg said to me, Holly, I need you to, to stop to screaming. <laughs> I, I need you to realize that you're affecting the kids. And so what I started doing was singing little kids songs and, you know, we made it down safely, of course, because here we are 20 years later, but, <laughs> um, but I, I recognize that, that they do feed off of my energy. And so to keep myself, my own well full, it's that analogy, you can't take water from an empty well, um, is, is I really come to respect the process of deep self-care. And I think the reason sometimes people mock self-care is you're talking about, well, here's a smoothie and, you know, here's my, here's my selfie on my way to the gym. Right. And, and you can get some stuff like that, but that's more, um, superficial, like a donut is superficial, right? It's not that it's not going to get, it may satisfy you for the day, but it's not going to give you the nutrition that you need to keep going. Um, I actually have done research on whether, um, pedicures count as deep self-care they don't there's no research papers out there on the value of pedicures which i'm really disappointed Dang, but, but you did plenty of research yourself right but, yeah it's, it's, you know it's something i do for myself but but the really deep things that that really keep me grounded are um, mindfulness and meditation um the practice of journaling it has been a consistent practice for me for many years and there's some, some really um, re solid research out of the 70s, but it's been replicated multiple times that you can journal for healing. And, and that's super helpful. You can do it digitally, audio, you know, audio, written by hand, whatever, whatever works for you. But that's something that is super powerful. Um, I have a spiritual practice that keeps me grounded and that involves reading um, sacred works and prayer. And it, it ties in with the mindfulness and the meditation. Um, which is different, but related, and then a practice of gratitude. And I've had times where, you know, I can be grateful that I'm still breathing and the sky is blue, <laughs> you know, I'm grateful for air conditioning. Uh, every summer, I'm grateful for air conditioning. But, mm -hmm. but as time has gone on, I've become uh, grateful for lessons learned from really hard things. I mean, I, part of that, I think, is age and maturity, <laughs> hopefully, right? But but there are times where I look back now and say, okay, I, I would respond differently now. And I do respond differently now to some difficulties. Like we're, we're not free from difficulty, just like every other family. And um, even just this summer, we've had uh, some surgical complications with a son of ours and he ended up with a tracheotomy and a feeding tube and it's totally unexpected. And I'm his primary caregiver now and at home, right? But we didn't expect it but I still needed to be able to stay grounded and to be able to say to the medical staff who was saying, he's going to go to a long-term care facility. I'm like, no, that's not going to work for us. He's going to come home, right. And be his advocate at the same time, right. And deal with, you know, all of those types of things, but that's how, and then I work with my kids. Um, I've taught them deep breathing. I've taught them relaxation. Um, I do have a background as a midwife and somebody who's been a lot of, at a lot of births. And those same kind of skills are actually super helpful. Mm. You guys are both just amazing. I know <laughs> you have a life beyond this podcast, but um, in, in finishing this up, I guess two, two part question, and then we'll let you get back to life. Would you change anything? And where do we go from here? You want to start? You want me to start? Um, I, I can go first. I, I wouldn't change any of the kids. You know, I, I, um, I love them all. There's some that are 
facing some real significant challenges. And I, if I could magically fix them <laughs> so that they didn't have those challenges, I would. But, you know, I, I, I think some of the kids, I, I think it was a, a turning point in their life when we had the conversation where I said, I'm grateful for you. And knowing everything I know, I would still pick you. Um, oh, wow. It, everybody needs love and everybody needs to be valued. And they have provided such love and value for us. They, they've changed us. And, and I'm grateful for that change. So what would I change? Um, I, I would be kinder. I would get mad less often. Um, I would, wouldn't work as much overtime. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that I would change, but uh, I wouldn't change uh, Holly. Hmm. And I wouldn't change any of the kids. I'm very grateful for all of them. That's wow. beautiful. That's beautiful. Holly. Um, I think for me, as I look back, what, what comes to mind is, you know, would I, would I want to know more? Because there were certainly times where I felt like I got way more than I bargained for, <laughs> right? That we did, that we, we signed up for kids with some known issues and then they had way more issues, right? I mean, th there's, there's some of that. And yet I think if I did know, I might not have made the choice, right? It might've been too scary. Mm -hmm. um, Ooh, if absolutely. I, if, if I had known more, right? it might've mm -hmm. been too scary to take that plunge. So I, I think I'm grateful for that. I'm, I'm grateful for the journey that we've been on. Um, I think, I, I'm still I'm still trying to find my way as a mom of adult kids of how do you keep the family together and the relationships going and you know you still have kids at home and you I mean you've got projects and illness and I mean all this stuff so how do how do we, how do people with adult kids how do they keep that all going I don't know yet but we're working on it um, and and I think for for going forward I, I mean I think one of the the things that I like to share with families the most is you've got to be flexible in your expectations and having kids with disabilities really helped us cement that in our heads. Our daughter who had physical and mental disabilities when she was born, we had to change our expectations. It was forced upon us, right? And and then after that we could look at her example maybe and say okay so they might look normal but their issues that they're facing help. Um, it means that their journey is going to look different, right? And they're not going to be a straight A student. And I don't care because they learned to read when they were 12, right? Um, those types of things. And so I, I think flexibility and expectations is really, really valuable. And then keeping yourself grounded. And and there is a huge emotional load, but the, the news, I, I guess the good news is, or encouraging news is A, there's things that you can do about it. And B, um, it, it, you can get through anything, right? And it, it can be overwhelming, but over time you get stronger and you get better and you learn more and you do better. And it really, I'd like to share the story of the donkey in the well. I know we're running out of time, but the donkey in the well, that fell in the well and he was an old donkey and the farmer's just like, I'm just going to bury him, put him out of his misery. And so he, you know, is shoveling dirt into the well. And before he knows it, the donkey is out of the well. And <clears throat> the donkey can talk in our little story and, and says, you know, every time a, a shovel full of dirt hit him on the back, he would tell himself, shake it off and step up, shake it off and step up. And pretty soon um, he was out of the wall. And, and to be honest, sometimes getting through some really dark days, it's, I need to make it through one more hour. And, and then over time, then I can make it through a whole day and then I can make it through a week, you know, and it's not that you get over your grief or the hard times in the way that we think you go back to the way it was before you never do but you expand your ability to um go through things right i mean we we have things where greg and i look at each other and say you know people will experience something and say oh that was the hardest year of my life and we're looking at them and going <laughs> we did that Wait, you got a bad grade in school and that was the hardest year of your yeah. life you know and i want to be supportive but we buried kids you know <laughs> yeah more than one yeah well yeah it's obvious that uh, ralph uh, M uh, ralph waldo emerson was right he was really right the more you do something the better you get at doing it not that it becomes easier so, well, we can't thank you enough. Greg and Holly Richardson has, have been our guests on the podcast today. 
And I hope uh, not only that you got something out of this, I know we did. And I also hope that Greg and Holly, you will come back because there wow. is so much more <laughs> that we want to talk to you about that just we haven't had time to on this uh, podcast, but hopefully you'll do that. And and recognizing that your schedules are so much busier than even ours are, uh, we know what a sacrifice it is for you to be with us. So thank you thank so you. much. Thank you so much for sharing your words of wisdom. That's right. Appreciate Anytime. it. Anytime. It's our pleasure. The website is hollyrichardson.org. You can go there and find resources for becoming all that you can be for dealing with stress and, and avoiding burnout, as we talked about here toward the end. And of course, details on Greg and Holly's remarkable adventure. Thank you so much for joining us. This is The Evans Life, A Remarkable Adventure. Bye-bye, everybody.